ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرورنا ونستهديه ونتوكل عليه سبحانه وتعالى واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه اما بعد فو بيجن اخواني اقتربوا بارك الله فيكم اقتربوا today we want to take this opportunity inshallah to clarify a few issues of what has preceded in this masjid and we may have to speak a little bit about some technical issues but it's necessary in order to clarify um what has transpired in terms of some mistakes that were made in some of the duros first of all as we mentioned before and we all have to buy into this because the nature of bani adam kullu khata in kullu bani adam khata'un all of adam's children they make mistakes we all have to buy into that there's no human being who is infallible except one and he is the nabi of al islam muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wasallam so we encourage all of you brothers no matter where you come from no matter who your sheikh is no matter who you're being taught by never go overboard in any style in al islam and we're talking about the ulama the real ulama never go overboard because he's not a human being except that he gets it right you take the most knowledgeable human being muslim on the face of the earth he's going to make mistakes make mistakes so if we are those people who are in abundance who tell us that we have to have make blind following make taqlid of people we reject that because it's no dalil in the deen from the quran and the sunnah there's no proof to say that you have to blindly follow anyone other than the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and not only that but blind following is one of the main aspects of al jahiliyah it's one of the main aspects of al jahiliyah that the shaitan is able and was able to lead people astray it's from the usul of al jahiliyah not from the usul of al islam and that's why when the prophets and the messengers came to their people the people used to always respond to the prophets and the messengers by saying things like no we're going to follow what our fathers were doing we're going to follow what our fathers were doing we reject what you're saying musa isa ibrahim ibrahim's father rejected his call to worship allah simple because it wasn't the call that ibrahim's father was upon all of the prophets and all of the messengers they had to deal with that so we can't be like that we can't be people who say this is my country this is my madhab this is my village this is what i grew up this la that's blind following blind following is taking someone's position and you don't know what his dalil is and what his proof is but when you take a person's position and you know his proof and you're convinced that his proof is correct you're convinced that his proof is correct that's not blind following the people have flipped the situation around if you take a person's position like our parents are muslims and they're on tawhid they're on salat zakat and all of these issues and we inherited the religion but as time has gone on we've read different things where we are convinced islam is the truth we don't call that blind following we call that al ittiba you're following the truth so al ittiba is to follow the truth because you know what you're doing and the taqlid is just to take a position you don't know why you're doing it. you grew up and when you hear muhammad's name sallallahu alaihi wasallam you do like this if someone asks you why are you doing that you say my mother my father they taught me that my sheikh my masjid that's taqlid because you don't know what you're doing you don't know why they taught you that why you're doing it but if someone said to you why did you choose al islam as your religion why are you a muslim why do you pray you're going to say because allah said it in the quran the prophet did it and so forth so that's al ittiba Allah Ta'ala mentioned about Yusuf in the Quran that he said to the people what the ba'tu millata aba'i Ibrahim wa Ishaq wa Yaqub ma kana lana nushrika billahi min shay I follow I make the tiba 
of the religion of my fathers, Ibrahim, Ishaq, and Yaqub. We will not make ship with Allah. So he used that word, al ittiba I'm following. Because he knew what he was doing. He knew that Allah wasn't the sun, the moon, anything other than that. So Al-Islam is against what's known in Arabic as Al-Jamud. Al-Jamud is this position that people have where they feel everything that the Medhab tells you, there's no room to change it or to alter it. You have to follow the Medhab 100%. And there's nothing that we should do new or different. This Jamud is against the religion and it's one of the reasons why the Muslims are backwards today. Backwards in the deen and backwards in the dunya. But especially in the deen. Especially in the deen. When we meet people from different walks of life, Muslims from different backgrounds, and you sit and you talk to them, every single different group, ethnic group, he's going to have his own way of practicing and understanding Islam. But you have to always be in a perpetual state of growing and developing. So everyone makes mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. And there's nothing wrong with rectifying your mistakes. Nothing wrong with that. Especially when it comes to the deen of Allah Azawajal. Allah Ta'ala has commanded us in the Quran, وَلَا تَقْفُ مَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ Don't go after, don't put your foot, don't talk about that which you have no knowledge about. That's lying on Allah. Woman other woman men of Allah Who is worse, more oppressive than the one who lies about Allah? He makes a mistake and he's saying what's wrong. And then he finds out what he said was wrong and he's too proud to change the mistake. What's wrong with him? So we want to rectify a few issues that we've said in public about the deen of Allah to bring the clarification to you so that we can free ourselves of any responsibility of misrepresenting the deen of Allah in the hopes that Allah puts this in our mizan of hasanat yawmul qiyam in our mizan of hasanat yawmul qiyam but I want to repeat and I want to reiterate Abdullah don't be a person who blindly follows people to the degree where you don't use the ni'mah that Allah gave you to, 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 to know your religion don't be like those people don't be like those people and those of you who are older whether you're older or not if the truth comes to you, don't be of the people who you can't calm down and say, okay, the truth is not with me. There's nothing wrong with that. No one has a monopoly on the truth. The truth from Allah's name is He is Al-Haq. He is the truth. So the Muslim is individuals, wherever the truth comes from, he's going to take it. it comes from the Yahudi, he takes it. From the lady, he takes it. From his wife, he takes it. From the sheikh, he takes it. If the truth comes from him, from a bird, he takes it. Like Adam's son who murdered his brother, he learned how to bury his brother's body, hide his corpse in the earth, from an animal. The truth comes from the jinn, shaitan, he's going to take it. The Prophet took the truth, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from people who brought it to him and they weren't on the religion. He supported the truth. When non-Muslims said this is the situation, he took it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or he confirmed it. So there's nothing wrong with a person saying, I made a mistake, and that is the truth. First point and the first issue that we want to bring to your attention is a hadith that I've been saying for quite a long time. And the way that we know that we made mistakes, two ways. We know that we make mistakes, number one, when someone comes and he tells you. That's why the brotherhood in Al-Islam is extremely important. We have responsibilities towards one another. A person sits in the audience and he hears something that was said that was wrong. It's his responsibility to rectify it. He rectifies it in the way that he sees the most appropriate, the most appropriate and the most effective way. That can be being rough, that can be being soft, that can be in private. This depends on the certain circumstance. Depends on the circumstances. That's why the deen is advice. The whole religion is given advice. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the believer is a mirror to his brother. And mu'min mur'atun mu'min. The Surah Al-Asr. All of mankind is in a state of loss. Everyone who is sitting here is in a state of loss. Except those people who believe and they do good deeds. What the wasu bil haq, what the wasu bil sabr. And they advise each other with the truth. Hey, you made a mistake. And they advise each other, be patient. The brother's going through something with his family, he has a sickness, so he advise, advises him, be patient. There's light at the end of the tunnel. The people who do that, they have iman, they do good deeds, and they mutually advise one another with the truth, 
and they advise one another to be patient. So we have a responsibility to make that advice to one another. So you let people know their mistakes. In Surah Al-Balad, there's a similar ayat where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, ثُمَّ كَانَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَوَاصُوا بِالصَّبْرِ وَتَوَاصُوا بِالْمَرْحَمَةِ and then those people who believe and they mutually advise one another with patience again and with rahmah. So we advise based upon these two ayats with three things. We advise with the haq, we advise with sabr, and we advise with the rahmah. We advise a person about the haq. Hey, you were wrong. This is what's right. We advise each other, be patient. And we're patient when we're advising one another and when we take the advice. We're patient when people try to advise you and they don't know what they're talking about or they advise you in the wrong way. You're patient with that. And the third one is Ar-Rahmah. When you advise people, your goal and your objective should be to put them on the Sirat Mustaqeen. Not to make them look stupid, not to put them down, not to make yourself look bigger, not to expose him, not to make him appear in public as if he doesn't know what he's talking about and so forth and so on. So that's one way people come to the truth, through mutual advice. And we're going to give you some examples, inshallah, not today, about how the Salaf, from the companions on down, how they used to give advice and take advice. And there were so many examples, like the famous incident that you all know about. Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, was one of the most knowledgeable companions of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. To the, pro- to the point where our Nabi said about Ali, aqda ummati Ali ibn Abi Talib. The biggest judge, the most competent qadi of this ummah is Ali ibn Abi Talib. That doesn't mean he had more knowledge than Abu Bakr or Umar. But when it came to judging, Ali was the judge of this ummah based upon what the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. And he has a lot of virtues. The first person to pray with the Nabi was Ali ibn Abi Talib. He has a lot of virtues. The point is, when he was the Khalifa, and he had the problem with the Khawarij. He had the problem with the Khawarij. The Shiite. They started to say that Ali was Allah reincarnated. They used to say, Ali, anta huwa. You are him. You are Allah. Ali, he became so upset. He had a hole dug for them. He threw them in the hole and he burnt them. Till they died. He burnt them. That's authentic. When that news reached Abdullah ibn Abbas, Abdullah ibn Abbas said he was right to kill them. They deserve to be killed because they're kuffar. They're kuffar. He said, but I heard the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, لا يعذب بالنار إلا رب النار. No one should punish with fire except the Lord of the fire. So you can't punish someone by burning them. When Ali heard what Abdullah ibn Abbas said, they brought him that news. When he heard that, he said, he has spoken the truth. And Ali ibn Abi Talib was sad for the position that he took. He was upset and he made some poetry. When he heard those people say a word that was munkar, he lit the fire on them and burnt them because he didn't like to be equated with Allah. Who's going to say that other than an individual who has lost his mind? So Ali radiallahu anhu, he dealt with the situation and what he thought in his own ijtihad. He's a scholar, he made his own ijtihad. These people have said a crazy statement that is from the biggest munkar. So I'm going to deal with them in a way that doesn't leave any doubt in the minds and the hearts of the people that this is unacceptable. And he burnt them based upon ijtihad. And when he heard the hadith of Ibn Abbas that came from the Prophet wasallam, he said he's right. And he made tawbah. He came off of his position. He didn't say, I'm the khalif of the Muslims. I'm older than you, Ibn Abbas. I'm the judge of the Muslims. I'm in Islam before you, Ibn Abbas. I'm better than you, Ibn Abbas. I'm the best person on the face of the... He didn't say that. He just changed his position. That's an example. And there are many examples from the companions and other than that. So people, they tell the person, Hey, you were wrong in that. You said it wrong, you did it wrong, and so forth and so on. Second way that we come to know about our mistakes at Khwani, especially in knowledge, is that as you continue to read and investigate and study, you start to find out things that you thought were correct, then you come to learn that they're not correct. How many of you people heard of the hadith, the most hated halal thing to Allah is what? Is divorce. Everyone heard that hadith. 
Many of us used to believe that hadith was authentic and we still say it because we thought it was hadith, uh, authentic. Someone's going to get a divorce so you advise him, give an advice to your brother, yeah, he take it easy, don't divorce your wife, be patient because the most hated thing of halal things, things that Allah loves that are halal, the things that he hates, they, they, it's the divorce. No, the Prophet didn't say that. Then someone brings you that information and you found out about it because you read about it and so forth and so on. You read about it so you change your position. So that's what has happened here today. Some people have come to me and they informed me that I was saying something that was incorrect and myself, I read and I came to find out on my own that something was incorrect that we want to rectify, we want to rectify. And the statement of Allah is وَجَلْ يَا أَيُّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أُدْخُلُوا فِي السِّلْمِ كَافَّةٍ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا خُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ Enter into Al-Islam wholeheartedly and don't follow the footsteps of his shaitan. This ayah enter into al-Islam wholeheartedly. I've been reading that ayah for so many years, using it so much for the delil that you have to come into Islam and give up any of your desires when they go against the religion of al-Islam. Your culture, your mind. Don't have one foot in the deen and one foot out of the deen. Don't interpret the deen. When the deen goes against you, you have to submit. And if you don't submit, at least be mad enough to say, but I know I'm wrong. You're doing something that you know is not correct. You know it's not correct. Don't try to make it appear in your mind or to others that it's correct. Enter to the deen wholeheartedly. When it goes against your culture, against your sheikh, against your madhab, against yourself, your parents. Don't have any reservations about embracing the deen. That's what I always understood that ayah to mean. But then I found out after reading that so many times and another meaning of the ayat is all of you people, everyone enter into Al-Islam collectively and be united it's one of the meanings of the ayat this is an ayat that informs us about the importance of unity amongst ourselves all you who believe enter into Al-Islam kafatan everybody come into the religion collectively on the same thing same aqidah same minhaj same understanding don't you be on something and you on something else and you on something else and we're in opposition to each other because the things that we're on, they conflict and you can't harmonize them. You can't harmonize them. This one hates the companions, that one loves the companions. This one over here, he curses the companions, this one he sends a taraddi on the companions and so forth. You can't harmonize those things. So the point is, as you read, you're going to learn new things all the time. So we have to, you younger brothers, Continue to read and read and read, especially the book of Allah, because the way the kalam of Allah is, every time you read this book and you start it again and you go over it again, it's going to unfold itself to you in different ways, all the time, all the time. So you have to keep reading the Quran and keep reading on your own about different aspects of the deen. I want to talk about three hadith here today. The first hadith, inshallah, is a hadith that was inside of Bukhari and Sahih Muslim that we've mentioned so many times and it's authentic. The 70,000 people will enter into the Jannah and they won't have any adab and they won't have any hisab. Abdullah ibn Abbas narrated this hadith. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he was questioned, who are those people, Ya Rasulullah? He told them that they are the people who don't request people to make ruqya. La yastarqoon. They don't ask people, come and make ruqya on. And they don't burn themselves. La yakdawoon. They don't do cauterization to get the disease out. Third, la yatatayyaroon. They're not superstitious. They don't make decisions based upon superstition. Wa ala rabbihim yatawakkaloon. And they have a tawakkul on Allah. I've mentioned that hadith so many times in this masjid and other than this masjid. And I used to mention that this hadith is authentic hadith, but Al Imam al Bukhari made a mistake in the hadith in that Al Imam al Bukhari said, instead of saying that they don't ask people to make ruqya, Al Imam al Bukhari narrated that they do not do ruqya, and that's wrong because the Prophet did ruqya, because Jibril did ruqya, and so forth and so on. I've said that so many times. There's a brother who's a revert, his name is Bilal, he's from India, he's a revert. He had a brother to call me and they wanted to know more about this hadith. And after I went back and I researched it, it came to my attention that I had it mixed up. That it wasn't Al Imam al Bukhari where the mistake is found inside Bukhari, but the mistake is in Sahih Muslim. So I want to clarify that now. 
that the mistake is with Al Imam Muslim and not with Al Imam Bukhari. The narrator in the chain of narration in Sahih Muslim, the narrator made a mistake. And Al Imam Muslim brought the hadith that way. Ibn Taymiyyah was the one who brought this to the attention of the people, probably the first person, Allahu Alam. And I just want to make that clear. Now, in saying that, Ikhwani, when we said that before, Bukhari made the mistake. That's wrong. And now we're saying the mistake is in Sahih Muslim. This is not an attempt to try to attack the Sahihain. If you see a person attacking the Sahihain, then be suspicious about his deen. If you see a person sitting, attacking Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim in a negative way, then be in doubt about his religion. What is he on? Is he even a Muslim? What is he on? Because these two books, they have withstood the test of time but again although these two books are the most authentic books after this Quran on the face of the earth first Sahih Bukhari and the Muslim although this is the case still because they are human beings they're going to have mistakes in them even if they're only a few they're going to have mistakes in them so the proof that Al-Islam does not accept Jumud where we can't move you have to just be stuck in a straight jacket knowledge is just say what the Imam said and the Madhab that's it is that the scholars came and they followed up Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim and Imam Al-Darqutni he found some mistakes and he dealt with in an attempt to purify and to complete Sahih Bukhari Muslim he came and he criticized some issues in those books. If he was an individual who said, no, those books are revelations from the sky, no mistakes, then the scholars would never have accepted any attempt. The scholars refer back to his book when they want to find out issues or inconsistencies or the problems of certain hadith in Bukhari and Muslim. And other than Al-Imam Al-Darqutni, Al-Imam Al-Hakim made his Mustadrak on those books and other than that. So Al-Islam doesn't accept this thing that some of the people are telling us that you just have to stay straight like that. Second hadith that we want to clarify is a hadith that you will hear all the time from the minbar. You will read it all the time in books especially when it's talking about making peace and not having anything in your heart against Muslims. And I've mentioned this hadith as a delil a number of times. And this minbar and other manabir and in durus in public. And that's the famous hadith that the Prophet ﷺ was reported to have been sitting with his companions. And he said to his companions, there's going to appear for, for you a man from this direction. He's from the Ahlul Jannah. And that man came. His beard was dripping water. And he had his shoes in his left hand. And he came and he sat in the majlis. And then the second day, the Prophet ﷺ said, Again, there's going to appear from this direction a man from Ahl al-Jannah. How many of you heard this hadith? The man came the second day, the same man, looking the same way. The third day he said the same thing. The companion Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As in this narration said, When I heard this happen three times, I was interested to find out what is it that this man is doing that makes him from the Ahl al-Jannah. So I went to that man and I said to him, I had an argument with my father and I swore by Allah not to go home for three days. So I really don't have any place to go. Would you allow me to come with you and to remain with you in your house for three days so that I won't be sinning because of the swear that I made? The man said yes. So he went with him for three days. He stayed with him every day. He never saw the man fasting. He never saw the man doing sunnah prayers. He never saw the man getting up in the middle of the night. He never do, saw the man doing anything special. So after the third day, the hadith said that Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As said to the man, Listen, what I told you happened between me and my father didn't happen. But instead, we were with the Prophet wasallam for three days. He said this and you came out and I wanted to know what were you doing. But now that I've spent these three days with you, I haven't seen you, I haven't observed you doing anything special. He said, it is what you saw. It is how you saw it. That's how I am. The only thing that I can think of that can possibly be the issue that causes me to be from the people of Jannah, according to what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is anytime. I don't have any hasid 
I'm not hasid. I don't have any hasid. I'm not envious or jealous of anything. Anyone Allah gave him something, I don't wish that it was taken away from him and it was given to me. And he said also, I don't have anything negative in my heart against any Muslim. This hadith is a beautiful hadith, no doubt. Because it's what we need. Not to have hasid and to try to get out of your heart enmity, hatred and rancor towards another Muslim. How many people are sitting here right now, he can honestly say, I don't have anything in my heart against any Muslim. No, it's very difficult. Those people are far and stretched out. They're not really many people. So I've mentioned this hadith. There are some scholars who have said that this hadith is authentic. It's one of those really difficult hadith to judge and to grade because of the chain of narration of what's going on. Now for those brothers who are writing, and there's one brother who writes in particular, I'm really impressed with the way he takes notes, I have to make this technical point to clarify my position and why I see this hadith as being a weak hadith and I have to take it back in public and I have to say no I won't say this hadith is authentic because I don't believe that the Prophet said it Sallallahu Alaihi wa ala alihi wa sallam. This hadith has been collected by a number of scholars in Al-Islam. One of them is the great scholar and he is Amir al-Mu'mineen in hadith Abdullah ibn Mubarak and Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak has a book called Kitab al zuhd in which he brings narrations encouraging the people not to be people of the dunya, to be zahideen. It shows that the Salaf, they paid attention to al zuhd Not the Sufism where the people are going overboard, but being people like the Prophet taught, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught us not to be people who are the sons of the dunya, fathers of the dunya. So Imam al-Bukhari and Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak, he wrote this book and he brought his chain of narration. His sheikh who told him this hadith is a great scholar in al-Islam. His name is Ma'mir ibn al-Rashid. Big scholar in al-Islam. Thiqa, Hafid. His sheikh who told him the hadith is another great scholar from the Tabi'een, al-Imam al-Zuhri. All of the long hadith in al-Islam, most of them and the Imam Az Zuhri is inside of them. Tremendous scholar muhaddith. Everyone is in agreement that he's thiqa, hafid, jaleel. And he said that Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu told him that hadith. So that chain of narration, if you look at it, there's no doubt that these people are the best scholars in Al Islam. And Imam Abdullah ibn Mubarak in his book, Kitab Al Zuhri, said that Ma'mad ibn Rashid told him. He said that Al Imam al Zuhri told him. He said that the companion Anas ibn Malik told him. You look at that chain of narration, there's no doubt that that is authentic. Then another book that was put in is a great book by the great scholar Al Imam Abdul Razak. His book, Kitab Al Musannaf. Al Musannaf. As we mentioned, this book is important because it mentions what the companions did, it focuses upon what the companions said what they did, what they were upon. It brings up the hadith of the Prophet, but the main objective of the hadith, what did the companions do? What did the companions say? So as a Salafi person, I need to have that book. Because when things come up, I want to find, can I reference this action back to what the companions did or said? Radiallahu anhum ajma'in. And Imam Abdul Razak is a great scholar of Al-Islam from Yemen. Abdul Razak, Ibn Hammam, Al-San'ani. He said in that book that he was told by Ma'mar, the same scholar who told Abdullah bin Mubarak. So Abdul Razak said that he was told by Ma'mar. Ma'mar said that he was told by Imam Zuhri. Zuhri said that Anas ibn Umari. Same. So that means Abdullah bin Mubarak and Abdul Razak were contemporaries and both of them took the hadith from Ma'mar. The third chain of narration. If you look at all of those people, they're perfect people. The third chain of narration is Al Imam Ahmed and his Musnad. And everyone knows Al Imam Ahmed. Al Imam Ahmed took this hadith that we mentioned about the man coming three days. Al Imam Ahmed said, I was told by Ma'mar ibn Rashid, who was told by Al Imam al Zuhri, who was told by Anas ibn Malik and the hadith. So he was a student of Ahmed said he was told by Abdul Razak because his 
Sheikh was Abdul Razak. And Imam Ahmed said, Abdul Razak told me, and then you just do the narration of Abdul Razak. So, Ikhwani, if you were to look at that hadith, that chain of narration, those men, beyond a shadow of a doubt, are all authentic men. But in studying the hadith a little bit further, it turns out that between Al Imam Al Zuhri and Anas ibn Malik, there is a person who was not mentioned. There was a person who was not mentioned, Al Imam Al Zuhri. His name is Muhammad ibn Muslim ibn Shihab Al Zuhri. He was from the small tabi'een. He took the majority of his hadith from the major tabi'een and not from the companions. So you have those older tabi'een who took the majority of the hadith from the companions. You have the middle tabi'een who took some hadith from the major tabi'een and some hadith from the companions. Then you have those young tabi'een who took the majority of their hadith from the tabi'een and a few companions. And Imam al-Zuhri was like that. So the problem here is when the tabi'i, the tabi'i, whether he is the middle, the major, or the small, sometimes the tabi'i may take the hadith from another tabi'i, and he doesn't necessarily take it from a companion. And if that's the case, you have to find out who that tabi'i is. You have to find out who that tabi'i is. Whereas if it was definitely a companion, then there's no problem because all of the companions are accepted. So it turns out that it appears this hadith has a tabi'i was not being mentioned and we have to find out who that man is and because they don't know who he is the scholars of the opinion some of them of the opinion this hadith is weak because an imam al zuhri used to make a tadlis he was a person who was mudallis meaning he made tadlis a little bit not a lot but nonetheless a tadlis is an issue that makes a hadith weak and it can possibly make the person weak i know that that's technical but I want to make the issue clear for you brothers. I want to take that hadith back and I won't use that hadith as being something authentic because based upon what I've studied, it appears to be something that is not authentic and we don't want to misrepresent the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even if you throw that hadith away, you put it on the side, you're going to have other ayat and other ahadith that can take, it, take its place to prove the same issue about the danger of having hasad the virtues of getting rid of hasid, the virtues of loving the Muslims and forgiving the Muslims and so forth and so on. So from those scholars who made this position is Al-Imam Al-Daraqutni. From them is Al-Imam Al-Iraqi, Al-Imam Al-Bayhaqi, Al-Imam Al-Kanani, Hamza Al-Kanani and Ibn Hajar Al-Asqalani. What was their position? Their position was that Al-Imam Al-Zuhri did not take this hadith from Anas ibn Umarik. Between Al-Zuhri and Anas ibn Umarik is someone who was not being mentioned. And as long as we don't know who that man is, he may be a companion, he may be a tabi, as long as we don't know, we, got, we can't judge it as being authentic. The third and the final hadith is what one of our brothers asked in the last class that we had, a hadith that has been used and abused by the people who insist on worshiping other than Allah and going overboard and practicing a religion that has not been sanctioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a religion that the companions were not upon radiallahu anhum in the ghulu that they have in the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in their shiuh the brother wanted to know about the ruling concerning the athar in which Umar Ibn al-Khattab al-Faruq was on the minbar. May Allah be pleased with him. And he was given the khutbah. And in the middle of the khutbah he just said, Go to the mountain, Sariya. Go to the mountain. Sariya was the leader of an army that Umar radiallahu anhu sent out to make jihad. While that man was fighting the enemies, the Muslims were losing the battle. And Umar radiallahu anhu had a vision. So he said in front of everyone, go to the mountain, Sariya, go to the mountain. If you make it to that mountain, you're going to put yourself in a strategic position to repel the onslaught. And the man did that. And then after some time, one of the members of the army came back to Medina. The Amir al-Mu'minin, Umar asked him, what happened with the army? He said, we all heard a voice. We heard a voice that day when we were fighting. And... They were getting the best of us and we heard a voice saying, Sadia, go to the mountain, go to the mountain. So Sadia took us to the mountain and we ultimately turned the ties by Allah's permission and we defeated them. 
And it turned out that they heard that voice at the same time that Umar radiallahu anhu said what he said. So it was a mu'jiza, the karamat that Allah Ta'ala has given the Amirul Mu'mineen Umar radiallahu anhu. So I looked up the hadith because at the time of being questioned I said I don't remember, I don't know. I think it's authentic but I don't know. I looked up the hadith. I found out that the hadith was narrated, collected by a number of people, Shaykh al-Islam, the Imam of a tawheed he narrated this hadith and he mentioned it a number of times relying on it and depending upon it many times in his book Majmul al many times supporting it that it's authentic and also making points and drawing conclusions from it showing that he believes in the karamat of the awliya of Allah but he never brings a chain of narration but you know from what he's saying that he sees it as being authentic because of the way he's drawing inferences from it and conclusions from it, supporting it. Also, his student Ibn Al-Qayyim mentioned it in a number of places. One of the places in this book, Kitab al ruh Ibn Al-Qayyim was criticized for this book. And some of the ulama said it was one of the first books that he wrote when he started to learn. And as a result of that, it has some issues in it that are not praiseworthy. So you may find a student of knowledge or a sheikh may rely on that book, Kitab al ruh the book of the spirit, in which Sufis can draw a lot of things from it to support their nonsense. So some of the ulama criticized Ibn al-Qayyim for that book, and some of them said it was one of the first books that he wrote, and he never went back over it to clean it up. And that's what some scholars do, just as you as a student. You hear something from a sheikh, you're taking the notes, and you just jot it down, you say, I'm going to go back and fix it up. And you never fix it up. Especially if you're an author. Anyone who writes books, this is what you do. You get ideas, you jot down the note in a special death start, a notebook, in a special place, and then you go back and you fix it up. Maybe you die before you do that. Your son comes, your student comes, he gets the book, he puts it together and he sells it. And it may be a bad reflection upon you because you didn't take care of it. You didn't take care of it. But it can't be your fault necessarily in this type of case. So the scholars criticize Ibn al-Qayyim concerning this book. So if a Sufi person comes and says, knowing that you respect Shaykh al-Islam, knowing that you respect Ibn al-Qayyim, they say, that book, that's in Ibn al-Qayyim's book, al ruh Hey, Akhi. Ibn al-Qayyim is not Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we don't believe in the straight jacket jamud in the deen. Everything Ibn al-Qayyim said was correct. Don't tell me Ibn al-Qayyim. And you brothers have to be careful. Some of the people of innovation, they won't accept what Ibn al-Qayyim says about the names and the attributes of Allah. They won't accept what Ibn al-Qayyim says about some other aspect of the religion of Al-Islam, but when they find in his statements, in his books, those things that support them, then they'll say Ibn al-Qayyim, Ibn al-Taymiyyah, Hamid ibn Abdul Wahhab. Don't be of those people. That's why we say to you over and over again, connect yourselves to principles. Respect people and personalities, but don't connect yourself to a person, to a person. My wife, I love her so much, this is my wife. But if she takes off that hijab and she curses Allah and Al-Islam, what are you going to do? My sheikh, my sheikh, my sheikh, I love him so much. And I'll pick up his thing, I don't want him to carry his bag. I'm going to carry his bag, I'm going to open up the door, I'm going, no problem. But if your sheikh does something that's against the religion of Al-Islam, what are you going to do? So connect yourselves to principles. Connect yourselves to principles. One of the people in Al-Islam that we wanted to mention yesterday, but because it wasn't our turn to give that dars. His name is Anas ibn al-Nudr. Anas ibn al-Nudr. He was killed during the time of Uhud. He was killed during the time of Uhud. This man, radiallahu anhu, he, his story in his istishhad on the day of Uhud is a tremendous story, tremendous story how he was killed. Shall I come back to that? Because I don't want to divert, although it was connected. Someone remind me of that, inshallah. Ibn al Qayyim, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, was criticized. But he brought the hadith. Ibn Kathir brought the hadith with a chain of narration in his book, Al Bidayah wa Nihaya. Once the scholar brings the chain of narration, he has cleared himself of responsibility. That's what the ulama of hadith used to say. If the person brings the chain of narration, he's cleared himself of responsibility because now he has put the burden 
upon you, the one who has the chain of narration in front of you, to go back and find out the reality. Even if he's using it and it's weak. He thought it was authentic for one reason or another. Maybe he thought the man Bilal ibn Abdullah was this man, but it turned out to be another man. He thought it was a man who was thicker, but it turned out in reality to be another man. But as long as he brought the chain of narration, now he made it your responsibility to go and to find out the reality. Even if he says it's authentic and it's not, he has one reward for his ijtihad. Ibn Kathir brought the chain of narration. And Imam Suyuti brought it in his book that he talked about the khurafa of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. a book of history mentioning the four khurafa and what they did. He brought this incident of Umar. And other than those scholars brought this book, this hadith and different books. So the point is, it appears, Ikhwani and Allah knows best, that the aspect of the hadith where Umar radiallahu anhu said, go to the mountain, go to the mountain, that part is authentic. It appears to be authentic. Someone gave me today a DVD, a CD, that I asked them, asked the Sheikh in Pakistan, the muhaddith, the one who is not a muqallid of anybody. His name is Zubair ibn Ali. Zubair Ali Zai from the ulama of hadith in this dunya. The ulama of al hadith. He doesn't have the shackles of taqlid on him. He doesn't blindly follow his sheikh. He doesn't blindly follow Al Albani. He doesn't blindly follow any scholar. He respects all of the ulama. But he has the ability to make his own conclusions. I told a brother this Saturday, please go to him. Ask him about this issue. I'm looking it up. I want to see what he said. A brother brought me the DV, the CD before the class. I heard that the Sheikh said that this hadith is not authentic. But until I listen to what he said and listen to his point of view, I'm not going to take that position. He asked I have to listen to it to see what he said. But based upon my attempts, measly attempts, and I'm much lesser than him, it seems like that portion is authentic. The other things that Umar radiallahu anhu said other things and they said things back these things are not authentic but it appears that that aspect is authentic and there are some things that were said about the hadith anyway what I wanted to mention very quickly Akhwani, is anytime things like this happen and they are authentic we accept them our religion believes in that when it happens with a believer a Muslim then that's from the karamat you yourself can have it you don't have to be the most righteous person, although the only of Allah, they're in a better position to have these experiences take place with them. Just recently, one of the biggest scholars in Al-Islam have died. His name is Abdullah ibn Abdurrahman al-Ghudayan, a real scholar in Al-Islam. He died last week. There's another scholar who is lesser than him in age, but he's an ayah from the ayat of Allah comes from a long line of Shinqiti ulama in Al Medina. He was young when I was in Medina and at that time being young everyone knew that this man is an ayah from the ayat of Allah and unfortunately the people of Ajah with Ta'adil used to complain about him simply because he didn't get involved in all of that kalam because he was a person who was busy with knowledge and his students. He was a scholar during that time a strong student of knowledge who used to have so many students in his Majlis, so many students, and as a result of that, they was hasid. They was hasid, and they used to put him with the qutbiyin. Anyway, his name is Muhammad al Mukhtar al Shinqiti. His great grandfather is the Shinqiti who wrote the tafsir book Adwal Bayan. He said, after the death of the Sheikh al Ghudayan, rahimahullah, he said, and he swore by Allah, two days or a day after, it's on the internet. He said, Wallahi, I had a stream about the Sheikh and I was with a number of the ulama of the past, some of the main scholars of the Salafiyyah. He mentioned them. He said, and the Sheikh came and his face was illuminated. And for some reason, he was the biggest and brightest face in the Majlis and all the focus and the attention was on him. And he was saying some things and he said, when I woke up, I was just thinking about why did I have this dream? And then he said later on, the next day, someone came to him and said that the sheikh had died. He was telling this story. I mentioned that just to say, just to say, these things happen. 
It can happen with you. You can have a dream about something and it happens like that. Shaykh of Islam ibn Taymiyyah, when he mentioned this thing about Umar radiallahu anhu, he gave other examples. How the cow spoke to one of the companions. So when it happens to a Muslim, it's from the karamat that Allah gave that individual. The Prophet told us that Allah Azza wa Jal has slaves. Lo aqsama ala Allah la abarrahu. Allah has slaves. If they say, Wallahi, this is gonna happen, or that's going to happen, then it's going to happen. Like if he's your opponent and you're arguing with him, and he says something like, May Allah break your neck if I'm lying. Allah has slaves who, if he says something like that, it'll happen to you. And that some of the companions were like that. Some of the companions, they made dua on people and they fell into the well. They were bitten by snakes. Other things happened because people made dua against them. Abu Bakr had the ability to tell the lady, you're going to have a baby boy. And he used to do that. Because Allah gave him that faras or that insight. Now when it happens with a kafir, and that's the thing, it can happen with a kafir. If it happens with a kafir, then it can definitely happen with a Muslim. It can happen with a kafir. The Dajjal, he has the ability to do all of those things. But it's not from the karamat and it's not a mu'jizah. In this case, when it happens with the kafir, it is istidraj. Allah is using that thing to send him astray and to send those people who follow him astray as well. The one who was lesser than the Dajjal, the little Dajjal, Abdullah ibn Sayyad. He had the ability with the Prophet wasallam. Prophet tested him and said, what came to me last night? What came? And the boy almost said the right thing. He had insight into aspects of the unseen. You're not going to reject that. That happened. But that's not from the karamat of Allah. That's not from the mu'jizat of Allah. From those people who had that ikhwani was Musaylama al kaddad Musaylama came at the end of the life of the Prophet Wasallam, and he had the ability to foretell the future. He had the ability to tell people certain things that were from the unseen. And then when he did that, some of the people started to believe that he was a Rasul, just like Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. And he said to Rasulullah, do you bear witness that I'm the messenger of Allah? The Prophet said, I bear witness, you're Muslim, the Kadhab, you're a liar. So for your information, yesterday we mentioned about the companion Wahshi, radiallahu anhu. Who did Wahshi kill? He killed Hamza. And when he met the Prophet, وسلم, the Prophet told him, can you take your face away from me? And he left, never came back, never saw the Prophet again. He lived. When the Prophet died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Musaylimah came and he started getting power because some of the Muslims apostated and started following him. Wahshi said, I killed one of the best of the Muslims. I'm going to make it my business to kill this man as well. Maybe, perchance, it's going to equal out that thing of eliminating Hamza. Now I'm going to eliminate this Kadhaf who caused all that fitna. And he was one of the people that participated in the actual murder of Musaylam al Kadhaf, La'natullah alayhi, and radiallah on Hamza and the rest of the companions of the Prophet. So the point here is the hadith of Umar radiallahu anhu, that effort, it seems to be authentic, that aspect of it. But although it is authentic, we don't go overboard in it. As we mentioned before, Umar radiallahu anhu was al Farooq. The Prophet had a dream, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and in that dream he saw that Abu Bakr was trying to pull up the bucket from the well, and he was struggling to get it up. And then it finally came up. And then Umar came, and Umar pulled it up very quickly and very easily. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what's the interpretation of, the, of, that, of that dream of yours? He said, that goes to show the power of the religion of Umar. It was a big bucket, bigger than Abu Bakr's, filled up with water, it came up fast, and it came up with ease. As we mentioned, Umar radiallahu anhu was from those people who were inspired, from the muhaddithin. Umar radiallahu anhu was the best human being after the prophets, then Abu Bakr, and then him. Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu was the one who the prophet says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if there was a Nabi who came after me, it would have been Umar. So we take all of those ahadith and we look at his position and we say, 
it's easy for Allah Azawajal to put miracles on his hands just like one of you who is sitting here can do ruqya on someone who has cancer and if Allah wills your ruqya can take the cancer out of their body by Allah's permission you have that ability you have the ability right now to see something, to witness something, to experience something that is taking place in another country if Allah wanted you to do that that's not something that is impossible what they call the third eye or telepathy that's not against our religion now we don't build our religion upon that deja vu you say I've been here before, I met this happened, this same thing happened maybe it did happen no one can come and say no it didn't happen Everything is transpiring as I saw it before. I had a dream that such and such has happened to my baby. So you call your wife and say, listen, keep an eye on the baby. Don't let the, guy, the, the, the girl go outside into the street. But we don't build our religion upon that. But in terms of it taking place, it's something that can definitely happen. That's what we wanted to clarify, Khwani Fimna, concerning those hadith that were mentioned in public. And I feel that they were incorrect. Because we don't want to be held accountable Yom of Qiyamah for saying anything And as I mentioned before I repeat and reiterate You brothers have every right to correct things that are being said And I don't mind It's your responsibility And I will never ever inshallah Become angry with you Or take some opinion Or position against you That is not um, The correct position Because you tried to clarify or rectify That which you perceive as being the truth if I don't agree with you, I don't agree with you. And I'll tell you I don't agree with you. As for cutting you off because you took another position that I didn't take in an issue where there's room for ishtihad, then this will never happen, inshallah, because we're not upon that type of his beer. Let us not be like the people of the past. And that's why I want to mention about that companion. That companion, Anas ibn Nadr, or Nudr. He missed the battle of Badr. He missed it. As a result of missing the battle of Badr, he took an oath. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I miss Badr with you. But if Allah allows me to participate in any other war after that, I'm going to show Allah and I'm going to show you what I'm made out of. Not that he was bragging, but meaning he was really going to put himself forward in the jihad. So the battle of Badr, Uhud came. In the battle of Uhud, he said... I smell the fragrance of the Jannah coming from that direction. I smell the fragrance of Jannah. He went and he started fighting those people. He just threw himself in the battle. None of the Muslims were with him. He just threw himself in the battle. And they annihilated him, mutilated him. Cut him all up. Cut him totally up. To the point that the Prophet himself, وسلم, who was the most intelligent person, had the best memory, he had the ability to identify things that maybe other people would forget. Even Rasulullah couldn't identify the man. He didn't, they didn't know who the man was. He was cut up so bad, mutilated, nose cut off, eyes taken out, ears off, chopped up, stabbed all up. The one who identified him was his sister. And she identified him based upon his fingertips. Like if you took that to my wife, my wife said, that's the finger of my husband. She knows, that's my finger right there. So he had marks on his finger that when the sister saw it, she said, that's my brother, Anas ibn Nudr. Allah Ta'ala, because of him, revealed the ayat of the Qur'an, وَمِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٍ صَدَقُوا مَا أَحَدُ اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُمْ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَضَرْ وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا From the believers are men who have taken care of their contracts with Allah, their promises with Allah. From them are those who have gone forth and taken care of the situation like him. And from there, them are others who are still waiting. Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman. So this man, he took care of his contract. Hamza took care of his contract. Musa ibn Umair. All of those people who die in Uhud and who die in Badr. This was an ayat encouraging the people to continue to get ready for jihad that was going to happen in the future. And then Allah described the other companions who didn't die yet. And from them are those who are still waiting for the opportunity in the war of Ahzab, in the war of Beni Mustalak and other than that. And then the ayat ended and we end this class with this ayat. The ayat said, 
وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا And they didn't change anything. They didn't change the deen of Allah. They didn't change what they were upon. So I want to advise you brothers. A salafia is, a salafia will always remain with the conditions or with the descriptions that it has. Don't be of the people who, you were salafi at one time and you were against blind following. You're Salafi now and you embrace blind following. You used to tell the people, don't blindly follow those great Imams like Abu Hanifa. Don't blindly follow them. When they make mistakes, make dua for them, but don't take their mistakes. But now you come and you change and you say, everyone has to follow the Shaykh that you put up. Even if the Shaykh that you put up is virtuous and he has haq on us, still, don't change. From the believer of the men, those people who have made their contract with Allah, from them are those who have gone forward and they've taken care of their contract and from them are those who are still waiting and they didn't change anything. Stay on the minhaj al salafi that doesn't waver and change based upon times and places. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Following the way of the companions. Taking the Quran and the Sunnah, understanding them and practicing them in every place and in every time the way the companions understood those two sources. Don't be of the new situation that we have. If you brothers have any questions concerning this uh, presentation, you can put your question forward. Halindakum shay? Okay, then inshallah, naktafi bihaab al qadr. Wa nasallallah. Fadl akhana Yusuf from Albania. If a person, as we mentioned, lying is a kabira from the kabair, you shouldn't lie. If you can get something by telling the truth, then you have to tell the truth. It's wajib and it's impermissible to lie. But if you are trying to get something that is wajib for you to get, and the only way that you can get it is to what lie, then it's wajib for you to lie. It's wajib for you to lie. You have to protect the blood of the brother. He's innocent. And the leader wants to come and he wants to kill him. And he asks you, do you know where he is? You know where he is. You tell him, no, I don't know where he is. But you should make tuqya. You should make tuqya. You shouldn't just tell an outright lie. You should say something that carries the truth in it at the same time. For an example, I know where he is. I know the house that he stays in. I know where he can be found. But when I tell this person, I don't know where he is. I mean, at this very moment, I don't know where he is at this very moment. Is he in the kitchen? Is he in the backyard? Is he in his car? But I know where he can be found. So you make the tukya. This is permissible. So if something is wajib that you have to do, then it's permissible. It's permissible. But again, lying is a serious issue. Only three cases you can lie, as the Prophet told us. Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Wallahu ala wa ala. Any more questions, Akhwani? That's another point, mashallah. I didn't get it, Yusuf. That what I should have caught on. This hadith is weak because of the chain of narration, as I showed you, between Al Imam Al Zuhri and Anas ibn Malik is someone. As some of the narrations say, that Al Zuhri said, I was told by someone who I don't accuse him, someone acceptable, but he didn't identify who he was. And that person said that Anas told him. Another problem with the hadith is in the actual wording of the hadith. The companion is lying. If this was authentic, the companion is lying in order to get knowledge. The companion was lying. So it is bringing the companion down unnecessarily. Like we told you about Hind, Bintu Utba. It is mentioned that after Hamza was killed by Wahshi, radiallahu anhum, they said that she opened up his belly and took his liver out and started eating his insides out. I don't care if you hate a person that much. You're not going to eat his liver. You're not going to eat his raw intestines. So we have to think. I'm not going to do that with the person who I hate the most. There's an individual I hate more than any other individual from the non-Muslims. I hate him more than any other individual. But if he was there and we got into a fight and I killed him, I'm not going to cut him open and start eating his insides out. 
because of my hatred for him? You think that that lady from the companions, her husband being Abu Sufyan, Abu Sufyan was in control of his wife. You think Abu Sufyan is going to let his wife get there and start eating the man out and the blood is on her face and all of that? It's something that's hard to conceive. So we say, since that is not established with what is authentic, it's from our religion. Don't accept that. Don't accept it. Because it sheds a negative light on that companion, even if it was done in the times of a jahiliyyah. So in this case, this would be a classic example of the companion lying. I had a fight with my father. All the things he could have said. I had a fight with my father and I swore by Allah not to go back and to be with him for three days. You can't cut yourself off from your father like that. Good point, Afi. I'm glad that you made mention of that before we left. You and Brother Yusuf. Jazakumullah khairan. Barakallah fikum. I think that's one of the most important benefits of today's dars, and it came as a result of the nasiha of the brothers. If you didn't understand anything about the techni technical things that were mentioned, understand that. The position of the companions. One of the reasons why the hadith is not accepted is showing a companion in a negative light. He's saying, I lied. He said he was lying to get something done and the lie that he told was unacceptable. And the lie is most high and most knowledgeable. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.